Hello and welcome back to chapter two of The Iron Man by Ted Hughes, illustrated by Tom Gould and published by Faber and Faber, who have kindly given us permission to share this with you. So if you remember, we left the Iron Man striding into the sea in search of his missing ear. Do you remember where his missing ear was? That's right, the seagulls had it, didn't they? So we're going to start on chapter two today and we'll start with a lovely picture to share with you. Chapter 2 is called The Return of the Iron Man. And we're going to find out who this character is here. One evening, a farmer's son, a boy called Hogarth, was fishing in a stream that ran down to the sea. It was growing too dark to fish, and his hook kept getting caught in the weeds and the bushes. So he stopped fishing and came up from the stream and stood listening to the owls in the wood further up the valley and to the sea behind him. "'Hush!' said the sea, and again, "'Hush! Hush! Hush!' Suddenly, he felt a strange feeling. He felt he was being watched. He felt afraid. He turned and looked up the steep field to the top of the high cliff. Behind that skyline was the sheer rocky cliff and the sea, and on that skyline, just above the edge of it, in the dusk, were two green lights. What were two green lights doing at the top of the cliff? Then, as Hogarth watched, a huge dark figure climbed up over the cliff top. The two lights rose into the sky. They were the giant figure's eyes. A giant black figure, taller than a house, black and towering in the twilight, with green headlamp eyes. The Iron Man! There he stood on the cliff top looking England. Hogarth began to run. He ran and ran. Home, home. The Iron Man had come back. So he got home at last and gasping for breath he told his dad, An Iron Man! An Iron Man! A giant! His father frowned. His mother grew pale. His little sister began to cry. His father took down his double-barrelled gun. He believed his son. He went out. He locked the door, he got in his car, he drove to the next farm. But that farmer laughed! <laughs> he was a fat red man with a fat red mouth laugh. And when he stopped laughing, his eyes were red too. An iron man? Nonsense! he said. So Hogarth's father got back in his car. Now it was dark and it had begun to rain. He drove to the next farm. That farmer frowned. He believed. Tomorrow, he said, we must see what he is, this Iron Man. His feet will have left tracks in the earth. So Hogarth's father again got back into his car. But as he turned the car in the yard, he saw a strange thing in the headlamps. Half a tractor lay there. Just half. Chopped clean off. The other half missing. He got out of his car and the other farmer came to look too. The tractor had been bitten off. There were big teeth marks in the steel and no explanation. The two men looked at each other. They were puzzled and afraid. What could have bitten the tractor in two? There, in the yard, in the rain, in the night, while they had been talking inside the house. The farmer ran in and bolted his door. Hogarth's father jumped into his car and drove off into the night and the rain as fast as he could homeward. And the rain poured down. Hogarth's father drove hard. The headlights lit up the road and the bushes. Suddenly, two headlamps in a tall treetop at the roadside ahead. Headlamps? In a treetop? How? Hogarth's father slowed, peering up to see what the lights might be up there in the treetop. As he slowed, a giant iron foot came down in the middle of the road, a foot as big as a single bed, and the headlamps came down closer, and the giant hand reached towards them, reached down towards the windshield. The Iron Man! There's a picture of the Iron Man, and you can see just how big he is. Hogarth's father put on speed. He aimed his car at the foot. Crash! 
He knocked the foot out of the way. He drove on faster and faster, and behind him on the road a clanging, clattering boom went up, as if an iron skyscraper had collapsed. The iron giant, with his foot knocked from under him, had toppled over. And so Hogarth's father got home safely. But next morning all the farmers were shouting with anger. Where were their tractors, their earth diggers, their ploughs, their harrows? From every farm in the region, all the steel and iron farm machinery had gone. Where to? Who had stolen it all? There was a clue. Here and there lay half a wheel, or half an axle, or half a mudguard, carved with giant tooth marks where it had been bitten off. How had it been bitten off? Steel? Bitten off? What had happened? There was another clue. From farm to farm over the soft soil of the fields were giant footprints, each one the size of a single bed. The farmers, in a frightened, silent, amazed crowd, followed the footprints, and at every farm the footprints visited, all the metal machinery had disappeared. Finally, the footprints led back up to the top of the cliff, where the little boy had seen the Iron Man appear the night before when he was fishing. The footprints led right to the cliff top, and all the way down the cliff were torn marks on the rocks where a huge iron body had slid down. Below, the tide was in, the grey, empty, moving tide. The Iron Man had gone back into the sea. So... The furious farmers began to shout. The Iron Man had stolen all their machinery. Had he eaten it? Anyway, he had taken it. It had gone. Also, what if he came again? What would he take next time? Cows? Houses? People? They would have to do something. They couldn't call in the police or the army because nobody would believe them about this iron monster. They would have to do something for themselves. So what did they do? At the bottom of the hill below where the Iron Man had came over the high cliff, they dug a deep, enormous hole. A hole wider than a house and as deep as three trees, one on top of the other. It was a colossal hole, a stupendous hole, and the sides of it were sheer as walls. They pushed all the earth off to one side. They covered the hole with branches, and the branches they covered with straw, and the straw with soil. So when they finished, the hole looked like a freshly ploughed field. Now, on the side of the hole opposite the slope, up to the top of the cliff, they put an old rusty lorry. That was the bait. Now they reckoned the Iron Man would come over the top of the cliff out of the sea and he'd see the old lorry which was painted red and he'd come down to get it to chew it up and eat it. But on his way to the lorry he'd be crossing the hole and the moment he stepped with his great weight onto that soil held up only with straw and branches he would crash through into the hole and would never get out. They'd find him there in the hole, and then they'd bring the few bulldozers and earth movers that he hadn't already eaten, and they'd push the pile of earth in on top of him and bury him forever in the hole. They were certain now they'd get him. Next morning, in great excitement, all the farmers gathered together to go along to examine their trap. They came carefully closer, expecting to see his hands tearing at the edge of the pit. He came carefully closer. The red lorry stood, just as they'd left it. The soil lay, just as they'd left it, undisturbed. Everything was just as they'd left it. The Iron Man had not come. There's a picture. The big mound of earth and the hole and the earth diggers, just as they'd left it. Nor did he come that day. Next morning, all the farmers came again still everything lay just as they'd left it. And so it went on, day after day. Still, the Iron Man never came. Now the farmers began to wonder if he would ever come at all. They began to wonder if he'd ever come again. They began to make up explanations of what had happened to their machinery. Nobody likes to believe in an iron monster that eats tractors and cars. Soon the farmer who owned the red lorry they were using as bait decided that he needed it, and he took it away. 
So there lay the beautiful deep trap without any bait. And grass began to grow on the loose soil. The farmers talked of filling the hole in. After all, you can't leave a giant pit like that. Somebody might fall in. Some stranger coming along might just walk over it and fall in. But they didn't want to fill it in. It had been such hard work digging it. And besides, they all had a sneaky fear that the Iron Man might come back again. And that the hole was their only weapon against him. At last they put up a little notice. Danger! Keep off! To warn people away. And they left it at that. Now... The little boy Hogarth had an idea. He thought he could use that hole to trap a fox. He found a dead hen one day and threw it out onto the loose soil over the trap. Then towards evening he climbed a tree nearby and waited. Oh, a long time he waited. A star came out. He could hear the sea. Then, there, standing at the edge of the hole, was a fox. A big red fox looking towards the dead hen. Hogarth stopped breathing. And the fox stood without moving. Sniff, sniff, sniff out towards the hen. But he did not step out onto the trap. Slowly, he walked around the wide patch of raw soil till he got back to where he'd started, sniffing all the time out towards the bird. But he did not step out onto the trap. Was he too smart to walk out where it was not safe? But at that moment he stopped sniffing. He turned his head and looked towards the top of the cliff. Hogarth, wondering what the fox had seen, looked towards the top of the cliff. There, enormous in the blue evening sky, stood the Iron Man on the brink of the cliff, gazing inland. In a moment the fox had vanished. Well, now what? Hogarth carefully, quietly, hardly breathing, climbed slowly down the tree. He must get home and tell his father. But at the bottom of the tree he stopped. He could no longer see the Iron Man against the twilight sky. Had he gone back over the cliff into the sea? Or was he coming down the hill in the darkness under that high skyline towards Hogarth and the farms? Then Hogarth understood what was happening. He could hear a strange tearing and creaking sound. The Iron Man was pulling at the barbed wire fence that led down the hill. And soon Hogarth could see him as he came nearer, tearing the wire from the fence poles, rolling it up like spaghetti and eating it. The Iron Man was eating the barbed fencing wire. But if he went along the fence, eating as he moved, well, he wouldn't come anywhere near the trap was out in the middle of the field. He could spend the whole night wandering about the countryside along the fences, rolling up the wire and eating it, and never would any fence bring him near the trap. But Hogarth had an idea. In his pocket, amongst other things, he had a long nail and a knife. He took these out. Did he dare? His idea frightened him. In the silent dusk, he tapped the nail and the knife blade together. Clink, clink, clink. At the sound of the metal, the Iron Man's hands became still. After a few seconds, he slowly turned his head and the headlamp eyes shone towards Hogarth. Again, clink, 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 went the nail and the knife. Slowly. The Iron Man took three strides towards Hogarth and again stopped. It was now quite dark. The headlamp shone red. Hogarth pressed close to the tree trunk. Between him and the Iron Man lay the wide lid of the trap. Clink, clink, clink. Again he tapped the nail on the knife. And now the Iron Man was coming. Hogarth could feel the earth shaking under the weight of his footsteps. Was it too late to run? Hogarth stared at the Iron Man, looming, searching towards him for the taste of the metal that had made that inviting sound. Clink, 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 went the nail on the knife and crash! The Iron Man vanished. He 
he was in the pit. The Iron Man had fallen into the pit. Hogarth went close. The earth was shaken as the Iron Man struggled underground. Hogarth peered over the torn edge of the great pit. Far below, two deep red headlamps glared up at him from the pitch blackness. He could hear the Iron Man's insides grinding down there and it sounded like a big lorry grinding its gears on a steep hill. Hogarth set off. He ran, he ran, home, home with the great news. And as he passed the cottages on the way and as he turned down the lane towards his father's farm he was shouting, the Iron Man's in the trap and we've caught the Iron Giant. When the farmers saw the Iron Man wallowing in their deep pit they sent up a great cheer, hooray! He glared up towards them. His eyes burned from red to purple, from purple to white, from white to fiery, whirling black and red. And the cogs inside him ground and screeched. But he could not climb out of the steep sided pit. Then, under the lights of car headlamps, the farmers brought bulldozers and earth pushers and they began to push in on top of the struggling iron mat all the earth they had dug when they first made the pit and that had been piled off to one side. The Iron Man roared again as the earth began to fall on him. But soon he roared no more. Soon the pit was full of earth. Soon the Iron Man was buried, silent, packed down under all the soil, while the farmers piled the earth over him in a mound and in a hill. They went to and fro over the mound on the new tractors, which had bought since the Iron Man ate their old ones, and they packed the earth down hard. Then they all went home, talking cheerfully. They were sure they'd seen the last of the Iron Man. Only Hogarth felt suddenly sorry. He felt guilty. It was he, after all, who had lured the Iron Man into the pit. Hope you enjoyed that. Tune in next time for chapter three. Take care, stay safe, keep smiling. Bye bye.